you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to read verses 6 and 7, where I'm finishing the series that we've been doing through this summer called Peter, A Living Hope. We've been studying the book of Peter, we've entitled the series, A Living Hope. So I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to read verses 6 and 7, and as I like to do here at City Church, I want you to stand in honor of the reading God's word. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. If you're new here at City Church, you came in, there was a brochure that looked like this. Every person got this. We actually uh, print these out almost on a weekly basis based on what's taking place here. But uh, inside there, if you're new to City Church, it kind of gives you some directions, kind of what's happening, your next steps, and kind of explains to our ministry and our church here. And then there's a connect card. We call it a connect card. It's a way that you keep in touch with us. And and there's a tear, it's the tear-off portion, and on the back, it, it's got some uh, opportunities or a place for you to fill out. And then on the other side, it talks about your next steps. And at the end of the service today, you're going to have an opportunity to do that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. And the Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast. Everyone say cast. Cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. This morning I'm going to talk to you on the topic of finishing well. Finishing well. Let's pray. Father, uh, grateful today for what you've done in the first two services. It's amazing. It's amazing to see, Lord, in the middle of the summer, people are coming who are hungry, people who want an encounter with you. We thank you for your presence that's been so real in our worship experience today in this service. And for those that have come this third service who need, and who need to hear from you, God, I pray that you'll give them a spiritual ear to hear. God, I pray that you'll help me today. Lord, I pray that you'll give me a mouth to speak. God, this is a, a new opportunity to demonstrate and declare your grace and your love to your people. I ask this, Jesus, in your mighty and your powerful name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, we had a, a, we had a, a really great vacation. And, and you know what? I say vacations for pastors are basically just sermon illustrations because <laughs> things happen on vacations that don't normally happen in your regular life, partially because you're just kind of, you know, it's a new experience, a new life. And, uh, and so we were on our way back from vacation, actually the day before we came home, and we were in the airport, actually we were uh, on our way to the airport in London. Put, this, uh, put that first slide up there for me, you guys that helped me out there. It says Earl Court. Somebody back there? Cool. <laughs> There we go. Awesome. And, uh, and so we had been in London for a couple of days. We were on our way back. And, and, and so the night before we were going to take off, I said, you know, it's taking a train, taking, they call it the tube in London, but taking the tube to the, to the airport, kind of a new experience for us. And so we're going to go and, and we're going to plot out our plan the night before. So being a good soldier, I go down and I get all the information. I buy my ticket. I, I talk to the guy at the ticket booth. I figure out the best pathway to get there. And so we show up the next morning. Well, they tell you for an international flight to get there three hours early. So we got up early, had a good breakfast, and we're going to head to the, make sure that we had plenty of time. And uh, so on our way down to the, the train station, we get into the train station, and it is packed. It's a, it's a Friday morning or Monday morning. No, the day was now, but it's a Monday morning, and the place is packed. I want you to see this next picture. Put that picture up for me. There we go. All right. And, um, I mean, it's just, and this is just one little rail area, and the place is completely packed with people. And, and so I had gotten the train number that we were supposed to take the next, that day, and I looked up on the big reader board, and there's no train number. Our train number, the train that we were supposed to take down to the airport, wasn't on there. And so I started to get a little anxious, you know. I mean, we still got time. We can figure this out. And so we talked to a couple people, and we jumped on to another tube. And so we get on this tube, and, and we're going a little ways, and we, we're talking to the person next to us. And all of a sudden, we realize that we're on the wrong train. We're going the wrong direction. So no problem. So we get off at the next station, and, and we talk to some people. We get pointed another direction. We get on that train, and uh, we're going a little ways, and guess what? We're going the wrong, we're on the wrong train, going the wrong direction. Now, this is two times. And uh, so we get another person, we get on the train, we're, we're riding a little ways, and all of a sudden we realize that we're going the wrong direction. Three trains going the wrong direction. Now my heartbeat. Now, as you know, we've had a couple of family conferences in between uh, the train rides here, and we've had some discussions um, about how to do this, and I kept, I'm in charge, I can do this. I know where I'm going. 
And so we finally got on the right train, and we sat down, and, and we're going the right direction. And all of a sudden, there's an announcement that comes across the loudspeaker, and it says such and such train number, the train number that we were supposed to be on. The subway workers, the tube workers on that train rail had decided to go on strike that day. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The one day that I need to take that train, they go on strike. Now, we made it. We went to the trip. We made it to the airport. We got there, and, and uh, I was very tense. By the time the clock is ticking down, and I'm starting to get really nervous. I mean, we, we needed three hours, and now we're about an hour, and that's how long it took us to finally get on the right train and get there. And I'm getting I'm pretty ups, uh, ups, upset. I'm tense inside, and the lady that takes care of us, she's so kind. And she fast-passed us, and she got us on there, and, and we made our way home. Now, listen, we, we could have quit. Right, we could have got stuck and said, "I'm not going to do that." Those those train workers, they quit. I can't believe it. We're not going to take that train down there. We're just going to stay here. We could have done that, right? But we didn't do that. No, we we finished. We actually made it back here. And and I was thinking about, isn't that how our life kind of works out? We make plans. We we make plans with our life, and we, you know, we plan on having a great marriage. And the person that we are married to decides to have. An affair. We 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 decide that you know we're we're going to go to school and get a good education, and we go get a job, and we're working really hard, and the boss decides to fire us. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen in life that we have no control over, and, and the fact is today there are there are things in our life that can potentially derail us from finishing the race that God has called us to, but it's all determined by our perspective on how we see it. And Peter is writing to the church. He's writing to a church that's been persecuted, a church that's been scattered, a church that's experienced a lot of suffering and a lot of pain. The fact is, is that this church, they, had, they were Jewish Christians who had been in Rome, and because of the persecution in Nero, they'd literally been scattered. And Peter is writing to these believers, specifically some Christians who are, are what is called modern-day Turkey today, but in, uh, to Asia Minor. Peter is writing to them, and he's reminding them. He's a good father. He's a good spiritual leader, and he's writing them a letter. He's saying, listen, guys, I want you to hear this. If you're a follower of Christ today, if you're a follower of Christ, you're going to experience suffering. Stuff is going to happen in your life. Now, for these believers, their suffering was a direct result of their faith in Christ. They were being persecuted. They were not just being mocked, but many were being killed because they wouldn't bow down a knee to Nero, to Caesar. They were Christ followers. They only had one God. It was a problem. It was a problem for the Romans that they were monotheistic, that they only believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they wouldn't pay homage to the Caesar. And so because of this, they were experiencing suffering. And Peter said, listen, if our Lord and Savior experienced suffering, don't think that you will escape suffering in this life. The fact is, as Christ followers today in America, we, you know, we, we are grateful for the, the freedom of speech that we have. We're, faith, we're grateful for the First Amendment. We're thankful for the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. We're thankful for the, the things that it affords us. But the fact is, the moment you say yes to Jesus, you surrender your will to him, and you make him the Lord of your life, not everyone's going to like it. And there are times that you might miss a promotion. There, there might be times that people in the job mock you or make fun of you because, you know, you, you're living a different life. And it, it's not that even that you would say anything to them in a negative way. It's just the fact that you've made a choice to say that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And at times we will experience suffering. But suffering comes in many shapes or forms. James says it's multifaceted. It looks in different ways. And there are cares and pressures and things in our life that can bog us down. And so Peter is addressing this. He's saying, listen, if you're going to serve Christ, you're going to experience suffering. But he said, listen, this suffering has a point. This suffering has a point. But listen, I want you to know, even though you suffer in this life, there's a greater hope. This whole theme of this book is that there's a living hope that Jesus is going to return again. And so Peter preached this, he pro proclaimed this, he taught this, the soon return, that Christ could return at any moment and take us to his eternal glory. Because, see, for Jesus, it was all about a relationship. It was all about a relationship with you. It was all about a relationship for these people. He loved them, and he gave his life for them. And he promised, he said, I will not leave you alone, but I am going to come again. I'm going to come again. I'm going to give you my spirit. You're going to be empowered. You're going to be able to serve me. You're going to be able to follow me. But I'm going to come again for those who are serving and seeking and looking for my appearing. And over and over, you see Peter addressing this issue of the re return of Christ. And then ultimately, 
Peter says, listen, guys, because Christ is coming, going to come again, there's a seriousness to this. How we live our life really matters. And he, dressed, he addresses relationships. He addresses how we should respond to one another in a husband-wife relationship and how we should respond our parents to a, uh, parents to the children and children to the parents. He addresses our relationship to our government, to our boss, to our life. And, and then he talks about a very personal area. He talks about our holiness, living pure before God, keeping our lives pure before him. So Peter is very serious. Guys, this is a, this is a, real, this is a real deal. This is a, this is a real challenge that every one of us will, will find. And listen, I, I love you. I, I, I want you to finish strong. So he writes these words in 1 Peter chapter 5. And I want us to jump right in here to verse number 1 here. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. To the leaders, the spiritual leaders among you. I, I want to answer this question today. How do we finish strong? And, and what Peter says, listen, every person, every person in the body of Christ needs to be part of a strong local church. Every person. Every person in this room, listen, I, I don't know what your church background is. I don't know where you come from, but I want you to know today, whether it's this church or another church in this community, God has called you to be part of his body. In the kingdom of God, there, there's no lone rangers. God hasn't called us to, to do church by ourselves at the beach or in the forest. That's not how the body works. As a matter of fact, we need one another. And Peter is emphasizing to the spiritual leaders, I want you to be good shepherds. I want you to be good pastors. And what you need to hear today is that every person in this room, room needs a good pastor. You need a good local church. You need a group of people. Good, you need a good small group leader. You, you need people who are concerned and care about you. And so if you're going to finish strong in this life, you need to look for a God-honoring pastoral team. Now, Peter gives some really strong admonitions. He, now, first of all, I want you to see he, he calls himself an elder, a fellow elder. Uh, and the, the Greek here, the word is presbyteros, but the, the concept was taken from the Old Testament Jewish, Jewish life, where there were men who were elders in the community, many times purely by age, but also by spiritual leadership. And Peter is recognized, he's actually writing this at the end of his life, and he's an elder man. He's an older man, but he's also a spiritual leader in the local church. I want you to see this. To the elders, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. He, he, he doesn't see a, a, a level of authority. He recognizes that he has been called by God to work alongside of other leaders and other pastors and other ministers. If you would read the last couple of verses of this chapter, you would see that part, Peter identifies two men, Sylvanus or Silas and Mark, who helped him in the gospel work. Peter didn't do life alone. And spiritual leaders, Christians, Christ followers, we don't do life alone. He appealed to them as a fellow elder, but he also appealed to them as a witness of Christ's suffering. Peter was there. Peter was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. Peter was there. Peter was there when Jesus set the multitudes down and began to teach about the kingdom of God. Peter was there when Jesus spat on the ground and made a mud pie and stuck it in a blind guy's eyes, and his eyes were open. Peter was there when Jesus spoke, when Lazarus had been in the grave for four days and declared and called him to come out. Peter was there. But Peter was also there. Peter was also there when Jesus was in the garden. And Jesus had said to Peter, Peter, I want you to go and pray. And Peter, like a good Christian, immediately fell asleep. <laughs> And while Jesus was praying and Jesus was agonizing over this decision for him that he was going to make to allow himself, the sinless son of God, to go to a cross, to take upon him the sins of the world. And while Jesus was suffering, Peter was there. Peter was there when Jesus was falsely accused, beaten, spit upon, mocked. Peter was there. When he was being falsely accused and tried under a mock sham of a trial, Peter was there. He was an eyewitness. He saw it himself. He saw the suffering of Christ as he was carrying his own cross to Calvary. Peter was there. He saw the suffering. He saw what Christ did. He, he, he was a personal, he was a witness to it. And I want you to hear this today. Peter had a personal relationship with God. 
And as a spiritual leader today, it isn't just, it isn't just what something that was written in a book 2,000 years ago. These words were penned almost 2,000 years ago. You know, this is a personal, real live person who walked with Jesus, knew Jesus. As a fellow elder, he was encouraging, guys, listen, I've seen this suffering. I've seen the victory that comes through on the other side. See, when leaders work with other leaders, there's a great sense of, of encouragement and challenge that comes. We complement one another. We coach one another. We correct if necessary. Last week, I was, uh, I was sitting on the front row, and I went out to greet and Pete, uh, uh, um, Keith had preached last week on love, and it was a powerful message. It was incredible. And as I walked out the second service, there was a guy in the back. He grabbed my hand, and he said, man, you have, you are, you have such an incredible group of young preachers here. And I said, you're right. And I said, I am so thankful. I am so grateful. You see, the fact is today that that was intentional. That when Miss Laura and I, we came to Central Florida 18 years ago to start City Church, we, we knew that we couldn't do this alone. That we would have to partner with other people that God had gifted and God had called. Ephesians, Paul says that, that Christ has given gifts to the church. And the fact is we have different gifts and operation in this local church that are ministering and serving. Peter recognized the responsibility for the kingdom to go forward, that it must take place in a team. And, and he said, listen, I saw this. And I, we, it, it's not just that we are going to suffer, but we are ultimately going to share in his glory. He was a witness to it. Look at verse number two with me. Be shepherds. Feed, care, tend, take care of. That's what it means to be a shepherd. Of God's flock that's under your care every good leader must pass three tests and peter is going to address these tests every good leader must pass the motivation test every good leader must pass the money test and every good leader must pass the morality test look what he says here in motivation he says be the shepherd care for tend, take care of god's flock be diligent be a shepherd our concept of pastor comes from the Greek, and literally it comes from the pastor, one who works in a pasture taking care of sheep. And good shepherds know their sheep. Good shepherds are there to protect their sheep. Good shepherds are there to try to make sure that their sheep don't get diseased and infected. Good shepherds, when one goes astray, tries to find that one, will lead the 99 because his heart is for the one. Good shepherds care. And he was encouraging them, shepherd God's flock. You see, the fact is today, this isn't my church. This is Pastor Glenn's church. This isn't a denomination's church. This is God's church. This is the house of God. This is the house of the Lord. This church has one senior pastor, and his name is Jesus, King Jesus. He is the leader. He is our Lord. He's the one that leads us into victory. And we are all under shepherds. We were serving this, we were serving this great shepherd. And Peter said, listen, serve. Not because you have to. Look what he says here. Not because you must, but because you are willing. What's the motivation? What's the motivation for a pastor? What's the motivation to serve other people? Every single leader will have to deal with this. Every single pastor has to walk through this ambition and pride and all the things that distract and detour leaders from, from having a right heart. What I've found, uh, I was meeting with a young pastor this week, and he's really struggling with, with personal ambition. I said, well, you just keep doing it long enough, and God will knock all that out of you. Because the fact is, the fact is, this is Jesus' church. It's his church. Jesus died on the cross for you. I didn't die on the cross for you. Jesus rose from the dead for you. I didn't rise from the dead for you. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's making intercession for you. I'm praying for you, but I'm not at the, at the right hand of the Father yet. And I thank God. Amen? I'm still here with you. <laughs> they serve willingly. Look what he says here. Look what he says here. As God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. The second test every leader must pass is the money test. Every Christian has to pass this test. Either too much money or not enough money. Now, how many of you would just like to try at least one time to have too much money? Come on, man. <laughs> right? 
I mean, you know, it's, it's like you're not supposed to talk about money at church, but the fact is the best hospitals in the world don't run without gold. And Peter knew this. Even in Peter's day, there were people that were manipulating other people to get money for them. At City Church, when we encourage you to give, we encourage you to give because you love God. You're not under compulsion. We do it freely. We, we do because Jesus gave his all for us, and we love to give. We live to give. It's the heart of Jesus. It's the heart of this church. It enables us to do what God has called us to do. But we're not pursuing dishonest gain. I, I, I was thinking about when we first started the church and churches this is one of the challenges challenges for leadership it's one of the many, one of the many reasons that people won't go to churches because they don't trust the leaders with the money and i remember when we hired our very first person that was helping us with the finances and i said your number one job your number one job at city church is to make sure that i don't go to jail <laughs> i'm going to trust you you're going to manage your money but handle it correctly we give an account to God for the way that we steward the resources here at City Church. And i got to tell you, I'm so grateful for the team. We do an audit every single month. We have seven sets of eyeballs that look at our finances. We go over our expenses. We're accountable. We, we have to submit an annual report to the, to, to, the, to the bank. It shows how we spent our money. We've done our very best. And i got to tell you, all to the glory of God. But this church has been in existence for 18 years. And in 18 years of our existence, we've had one year where we didn't have an increase. One year in the midst of the recession. Every single year we've seen. Some years it might have been small, a 5% or a 10%. Some years it's been big, 25 30%. But for 18 years, we've seen the blessing of God in our resources. Because we've made a commitment to steward the monies that God has given to us. And look at this last area here. Not lording it over those entrusted you, but being an example to the flock. Being an example to the flock. The last test that every leader must pass is the test of morality. Specifically, Peter is talking about the, the way that these men would lead, the way that they would, they would exercise their authority over others. See, we're not dictators or kings. We're simply servants. Someone once said that a pastor is like one beggar offering another beggar a piece of bread. The heart of a good shepherd is to serve the people. And Peter's saying, listen, guys, it's not about preeminence. It's not about position. It's not about title. Any person that needs a title to pastor, I always have a big question mark. I, I don't need a title. I don't need a title to preach. I don't need a building to preach. I just simply need a, myself a willing heart to be, be, be willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. And Peter's saying, listen. Be an example. Aristotle had this golden rule for orators. He said you have to the pathos, the ethos, and the logos. You gotta have the passion. You gotta believe what you're saying. You gotta have the ethics. You have to have the lifestyle. You, your life has to be an example. But you also have the words. You also have to have the ability to, to communicate, to move other people. And the fact is today that God, God holds accountable the leadership of a local church. God holds me accountable. James says, listen, don't strive to be a teacher or a leader in the church because you will come under greater judgment there's an accountability factor and it scares the daylights out of me sometimes but the fact is we're called to be an example i was thinking of just a, a couple of years ago when one of our presidents had a, a moral indiscretion as the newspaper would call it there was an op-ed piece that came out in the new york times and it said this character doesn't matter that's exactly what the op-ed piece said Hey, economy's going good. President's leading well. Wow, what he did over here in the back doesn't really matter. It does matter. It matters to God. God sees. God knows. As a matter of fact, when Peter was writing to the church at, 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 at this scattered church in chapter 4, he says, and judgment will begin in the house of God. God does care about our character. God does examine the way that we live before him and before other people. I tell people all the time, here's the deal. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect dad. I'm not a perfect pastor. But my job here today is to point you to the one who is perfect. There is one who is perfect in every way. There is one who is perfect in, in his lifestyle and example. There is one who are, we are seeking to follow, and his name is Jesus. Someone said amen. amen. So listen, guys. If you're going to shepherd, if you're going to lead, people are going to trust their lives, their spiritual lives to you. Lead well. 
The second thing that I want you to see, if we're going to finish strong, is that we must be willing to surrender our will to God. We must surrender our will to God. Look at verse number six with me, please. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Everyone say humble. Now, sometimes in our culture, we think of someone who is humble, a, a person of humility, as kind of someone that just lets other people run roughshod over them. They're kind of meek. They're a milk toast. They're wimpy. Uh, that's not biblical humility. Biblical humility knows this. You know who you are. You know what you are. And you know whose you are. You see, you know who you are. You know who you are in Christ, that without Christ, you can do nothing. When you recognize that God has gifted you or God has given you the ability to do something and you're working at it, whatever you are doing and God gives you favor and grace and success, you recognize that it's from God. You recognize that everything is from him. Jesus told the disciples, he said, after you've labored, after you've been successful in ministry, after you've done everything you know to do, you tell yourself, I'm an unworthy servant. You recognize that everything in you, everything that God has given to you, every gift and every grace is simply because of his kindness and his love for us. Peter humbles. He said, humble yourselves. If you're going to experience God's grace, if you're going to experience God's help, we humble ourselves under his mighty hand. Jesus demonstrated this attitude for us in Philippians. Paul says, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus who humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. That's humility in one word, obedience. Saying yes to Jesus. The moment you say yes to Jesus, you are humbling yourself from a life of self-control. See, there's two ways to live. You live with God in charge or you live with yourself in charge. See, pride says, I can do it. Pride says, I don't need anyone else to tell me. Pride says, I can figure it out. Pride says, I don't need the government to tell me what to do, the church to tell me what to do, the work to tell me what to do. Uh, pride says, it's the other person's fault. Pride is critical of other people, judgmental of other people. Pride is brash and, and harsh towards others. Peter says, listen, humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Micah chapter 6, Micah tells us this is how we are to do it. This is how we are to clothe ourselves with humility. He says, listen, guys, he has told you, oh, man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Whew. What has he told us to do? He told us to walk. Walk. Walk with him. Walk with him on a daily basis. Recognize when you surrender, when you say yes, when you surrender your will, you're saying yes to God and your daily activities and where you go and what you do and how you live. When you humble yourselves, you're saying, Lord, I can't do this without you. I need you today. He's with you. He hasn't forgotten you. He sees. He cares. He knows. He must be your God. Humble yourself walk humbly with your god it can't be your grandfather's dad god it can't be your wife's god it can't be the church's god it can't be your pastor's god he must be your god you must have a personal relationship with the lord jesus christ yourself i want you to know today he's god all by himself he cares for you he loves you i want you to see here in this next verse I want you to see what he says. He says, listen, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. When you surrender your pride to self-will, when you surrender your pride to be in control of your life, you cast all your cares, you cast all your problems, you cast all the challenges, all the trials, all the relationships, all the resources, you give them all back to God. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Cast all your anxieties, all your fears, all your worries. I told someone once, I said, uh, I said uh, I'm like a good fisherman. I said, I know how to cast it out far. I said, but I keep wanting to reel it back in. And isn't that what we do many times with the challenges of our life? We cast them, we give them to God. But then a problem arises and immediately we, we take that anxiety, we take that fear back upon ourselves. 
how we're going to do this. How is this going to happen? How are we going to pay this bill? How, 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 uh, God, I did this, and God, this hasn't worked this way. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? We get stuck in the sense of it's not going to work. God says, no, no. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. I am with you. The promise of God today is to those who believe. God cares. Peter said, as you cast your care upon him, he'll care for you. Hear me today. Our culture today is inundated with people, not just believers, but all kinds of people who have not been able to cast their cares upon God. We have a culture, a generation of self-medication. We have a culture and a generation that we're looking for a pill or a solution outside of God. And I want to help you today. Paul said, cast all your cares, all your anxieties. Come to God. Leave it to Him. And by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And in the peace of God, that peace. When you cast all your cares, you're saying, God, I can't, but I know that you can today. And here's what happens. Look at verses 8 and 9 with me. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. If you're going to finish strong, you must wage warfare against your enemy. You have a real live enemy. He hates you today. His plan is to destroy you today. Peter says, be alert. Be sober. Be alert of mind. Be sober. Look at verse number 8. Can you put the verse number 8 back with me? Be alert. Be sober. You see, the fact is today we must respect our enemy. He is a formidable foe. He was a creation of God. He has already been in heaven. He, as a matter of fact, the Bible says that when he was in heaven, his name was Morning Star, Lucifer. And he led the host of heaven into praises and worship of God. But Satan had an issue. Satan had a problem. And in one moment, Satan in his heart rose up against God. And he said, I can do it better than God. I can, I can do it better than God. And in that moment, the Bible says that God cast Satan out of heaven with a third of the angels. With his right hand, God dismissed the enemy and removed him from the, his very presence. And from that day, Satan has had a mission. Jesus said the thief comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. He wants to destroy your home. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your finances. He wants to destroy your relationships with your kids. He wants to destroy your life. He's your adversary. He's a liar, the father of lies. He's come to deceive and to destroy. He wants to tempt you to disobey God. He wants to, to test you by wearing you down with discouragement. He wants to tell you lies, to fill your mind full of doubt and unbelief. Peter says, resist him. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in your conviction that God is for you, that God cares, that God sees, that God loves, that God knows exactly what you're walking through and experiencing today. Well, how do I do that? How do I stand firm? We always look to our example, the perfect one. His name is Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus, after he had fasted for 40 days, the enemy came to do the same to him that he does to you and I. To deceive us, to lie us, to, to lie to us, to discourage us. And the Bible says that Satan came to Jesus in Luke's gospel, chapter 4. If you then will worship me. Isn't that the devil hangs in front of you? Isn't the devil hangs in front of you? That there's another way to find happiness outside of God. There's another way to find fulfillment outside of God. There, there's another way to experience pleasure outside of God's grace. The enemy hangs that in front of every one of us in this room. Every person here is tested by the enemy. You see, there's only two things that you can worship. You can either worship, you can worship God, our Lord and Savior, or you worship the devil and his ways. Uh, there, there is a very narrow path that Christ has laid out for every person in this room. And Satan says, if you worship me, all will be yours. That's a lie. 
What Satan brings is bondage. What Satan brings is death. What Satan brings is destruction. What Satan brings is divorce. What Satan brings is addiction. What Satan brings is debt. What Satan brings is pain. That's what Satan brings. Look what Jesus does. This is how you resist him in the faith. Satan, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. For it is written. The first thing that Jesus did in encountering the enemy... He didn't argue with him. He didn't get in long discussions with him. He simply says, Satan, get behind me. It is written. When the enemy attacks your mind and bombards your thoughts with doubt and evil thinking, just trying to wish it away, it isn't going to happen. You have to exercise the person that God has created you to be as his child. You have to exercise that power and that authority that he's placed inside of you. And you declare God's word. It is written. It is written. It is written today. It is written. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall abide forever. It is written today that thy words shall be a lamp unto my feet and a, a light unto my path. It is written. It is written that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword divided between soul and spirit. It is written. It is written power of God's word today it is written have faith in your God have faith in the obstacles the mountains the challenges the doubt the discouragement the debt the brokenness that comes into our world and our reality Jesus says you will speak the word of God you will say to that mountain be that removed and cast into the sea and not doubt in your heart but believe you see you have a faith an act of faith at work in your life because the Holy Spirit is in you you have God's word as a, as a weapon of warfare. Paul says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God through the pulling down of strongholds. God's created you to be a victor today. You're not a victor. God doesn't want us to live defeated and broken into despair. He's called us to be people who are overcomers. It is written. And then look what else he says. Worship the Lord your God. Worship. Wow. Worship. Worship isn't just watching someone sing a song off the screen. Worship is our life. But there's something that powerful that happens when you get in God's presence in an atmosphere like a church service like this. There's believers that are singing the praises of God. They haven't talked about the spirit of freedom and liberty. There's a grace. There's a tangible reality that God's presence is with us. It is written, worship the Lord your God. I don't know how you ended up here today. I don't know what kind of church background you have. For many of you, lifting hands in worship is an uncomfortable or unusual thing. I would encourage you. When we worship God, when we begin to sing to Him, and we lift up hands to Him, the Bible says that we lift up holy hands. The Bible admonishes us, it encourages us to lift up holy hands unto the Lord without wrath or doubting. We're lifting up holy hands. We're acknowledging God. I need you today. I've come to worship you. Worship the Lord your God and worship Him only. We worship Him. The last thing, if we're going to finish strong, I want you to see this. We've engaged in warfare. God's given us grace to live in victory. The last thing that I want you to see here is today is that we embrace the grace of God to the very end. We embrace the grace of God to the very end. Look what he says here in verse number 10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. He's the God of all grace. He's a God who's a God. His riches, his kindness, his favor, his love is for you. The God of all grace has called you. He's called you by name. He knows you. He cares. And the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory. I want you to hear this today. You might suffer. You might have pain. You, you might be walking through some tribulations and trials. But God has called you to his eternal glory. God has called you to his, his life with him. In this life, you might have pain and suffering for a little while. But God's given us the power to stand strong to the end. Paul the Apostle wrote these words to the church at Corinth. He said, I said, I asked the Lord three times that this challenge, whatever it was, might depart from me. 
God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made weak, perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will make my boast in weakness that the power of Christ might rest in me. There's two things that I've learned about suffering of pain. It's an opportunity for me to grow, become more like Jesus, but it's also an opportunity for me to embrace the grace of God, to see God show up and show off in my life. As we embrace God's grace in our life, as we, as we, as we walk out this journey to the very end, the promise of God is that he will restore us.